but um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Teresa DeWild. I'm a program specialist for Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Um, and we have a guest today, um, Ms. Lindsay Grovenstein. She Hello, was, everyone. yep, go ahead and do your introduction. Let everybody know what you do. Of course, thank you, Teresa. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I was really glad to be invited. Uh, my name is Lindsay Grobenstein. I'm the project coordinator here at Beyond the Bell. Uh, we are a local nonprofit in the city of Savannah as well in DeKalb County. And we work to prevent underage alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco use. So we've been working with Teresa a lot um, with this because we have similar, we have similar missions. So it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. Okay, so our roadmap for today is um, our topic is why 21 is the drinking age. And so we're going to go through like, you know, admission, um, why the drinking age is 21. And throughout the presentation today, we're going to have um, some polling questions for um, you guys to answer to help try and learn and understand why the, um, why we have the age of 21 in the United States. So MAD's mission um, is to end drunk driving, help fight drug driving, support the victims of this violent crime, and to prevent underage drinking. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And a lot of people want to know why MAD is so concerned with underage drinking. And again, that's why the topic is Y21 for today. So for those of you in the audience that are under the age of 21, um, so we want you to try and think like into the future, like different things that you want to do for yourself. So like, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, and do you think that alcohol and drugs would interfere with your goals that you have for the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. How would getting involved with alcohol and drugs impact to where you want to be? And then situations might come up or have already come up. Um, with what you're trying to have as your goals that may get in the way of what you want to do. So our first poll question for today. Um, oh, sorry, I missed that. Um, go ahead and fill this in for me. Like, let me know how old you guys are out there. Um, and um, so that way we can kind of see who we have in our audience. I forgot to the last slide, I'm sorry. Ah, so we actually have all adults over the age of 21 or somebody or most of you guys are in college maybe. That's actually pretty cool. Let's see how many people know this one. Okay, so our next question here is what year was the drinking age set to 21? So how many people know this one? Oh, and I just realized there was a boo-boo on this one. Did anybody else catch it? No, I guess that's good then. Yep. <laughs> oh, no one can tell. It's great. Yep. Okay. Okay. So we are actually kind of split on this one. So we have, it's supposed to say 1984 instead of 1983 and 1978. So let's see what the actual answer is. 1984. So President Reagan was the one that actually signed it into law, the Uniform Drinking Act, which mandated that all states adopt 21 as the legal drinking age within five years. And actually by 1988, all states had said 21 is the minimum drinking age. So now the next question is, which state do you think was the last state to implement the age 21? So was Iowa, Wyoming, Louisiana, or Georgia? 
So, what do you guys think? It's always interesting how long it takes for a law or policy to actually be put in place. Trickles down. Yeah. We'll see. Okay. It's kind of split amongst the board on this one. It's actually pretty cool. But the answer to this question was Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana was the last state to raise their drinking age to 21. Um, the federal government, when they passed this act, actually forced the states to do so by taking away their federal funding for the highways um, to help mm -hmm. them anything, and they, they took away 5% of their funding. Um, the interesting information that I found out by seeing videos and um, reading up on this was Louisiana actually kept changing their constitution and they kept having like loopholes within it. And there was actually a time frame in 1996 for three months that the um, age of uh, drinking was actually dropped back down to 18. Um, and it was only for three months in 1996, but they were actually the last state to make it 21. Now we're gonna go over a little bit of the Georgia law um, for underage drinking. And if you look at these penalties and fines, if you um, get caught drinking or having possession or trying to purchase alcohol, um, mind you, these are all within a five year period. However, um, even the first time offense is still pretty harsh for the state of Georgia. They're actually one of the harshest states in the nation for fines um, and jail time and community service. So when you read through these, just kind of notice how um, harsh the penalties are for those under the age of 21 and how mm -hmm. it gets higher um, if you're within that five year period. And also note at the bottom that the BAC for anybody under 21 is 0.02. Even legal BAC is 0.08, but that's for somebody over the age of 21. So you shouldn't have any alcohol in your system if you are under the age of 21. Okay, so for our next poll question, what percentage of 6th to 12th graders in Georgia reported they consumed alcohol in the past 30 days? Got one more person left to vote. One person, did they step away? No, it's okay. Okay, so we had Nobody really thinking about it. What the majority says. So let's see what the actual answer is. Most people thought 44%. Yeah, most thought 44. And the real answer here is 8%. And so I want to talk a little bit, just a little bit about this. The idea that we have a misperception about how many kids are actually using. There tends to be uh, a gross misperception that all the kids are doing it. Most of the kids are doing it. And this is particularly um, concerning when other peers think this of their peers. So if all the kids are thinking that everyone's doing it because of what they see in media, what they hear in the news, just our general social norms. Um, but in fact, just 8% of students had reported that they had consumed alcohol in the past 30 days, which means that it's not as normative of a behavior as we think it is. And this is really important to push because if we actually push that the social norm is healthy choices, then kids are going to be more inclined to act in that way because they realize that the peer pressure is just really made up in the end. And so this is something that here at Beyond the Bell, we try to push our positive social norms to let people know, you know, most people we would think it's about half the kids 
that are using frequently because the past 30 days is a indicates frequent use and we think it's half of them but really it's a, it's a small percent and that's something to keep in mind as well okay uh, same group of youth that our youth that were um, questioned was what percentage of 6th to 12th graders in Georgia reported that they had tried marijuana um, this is something that Matt has also started taking interest in because a lot of states across the U.S. right now are starting to legalize marijuana. So we asked the same group, you know, how many have reportedly tried marijuana? So we'll ask the same question. So what do you think 12 percent, 32 percent, 52 or 72 percent? Oh, we're actually kind of all over on this one. That's pretty cool. Nice. Mm. And then really it's 12 percent that have tried it um, and, and of course, this is a little bit more of they've ever experimented, not if they're frequently using. So of course, I kind of gave it a little bit away with my last, with the last slide saying that our misperception tends to be off. You know, um, it's, we think everyone's doing it, um, especially with marijuana. This is an interesting conversation because of um, different states that have started legalizing it. I'll talk with, with the youth and um, I'm sure we all hear it. Uh, it's just medicinal. Um, it's natural, it's, it's fine. And so that type of misperception can make kids think that, well, everyone's doing it because it's um, harmless, but we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as well. Okay, so this is another thing that gets brought up, especially with youth um, when we discuss um, the Y21, is that a lot of European nations um, allow their youth to drink under the age of 21. Um, uh, that has actually changed throughout the years. The um, Europeans don't have the 18 age anymore, the 16 age anymore. They're starting to adopt the same laws that we have here in the United States um, with the age of 21. Um, and as the slide here shows, you know, a greater percentage of youth um, in a majority of Europe report binge drinking at a higher rate compared to their counterparts. Again, this is not true. Um, they have a tendency to um, try to get their youth to not drink. Um, you know, many years ago it wasn't the same, but they were starting to realize that they were having the same problems that we were by having their youth drink younger, saying that it was okay, it wasn't that big of a deal, it was a social norm. Um, but a lot of them have adopted the same policies that we have. But you also have to realize that their laws, especially when it comes to drinking and driving, are a lot stricter than what they are here. Um, for instance, like in Italy and Germany, if you have um, even your keys in your pocket and you're walking away from a pub, um, they can actually charge you with DUI directly from there. So that's something else that you have to um, look at as well. Mm. Um, the same with like advertising. These are kind of something that, you know, you have to look at too. I mean, back in the day, I mean, there were doctors that were actually telling parents, you know, which cigarettes were the best to smoke. Crazy. Um, it, it's completely different now. I mean, we know so much more than what we did back in the day. I mean, think about, you know, what, what was, you know, advertised towards kids, you know, what alcohol is the best for, you know, kids to have. And, and that goes again to social norms. Back then, it was the social norm for everybody to smoke cigarettes, doctors were doing it, and we saw in those advertisements, but then we learned, and then the norms changed um, based on it, but it's really interesting to see how it used to be. Okay, so now we're on to our next poll. Around what age does the brain finish developing? Mm We have late teens, mid 20s, 35-ish, early 40s. Myself, I think it's early 40s because I'm <laughs> every day. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. 
which already has mid 20s. So let's see. No, majority ruled on that one. That's pretty good. But yeah, it is. It's mid 20s. <clears throat> this kind of gives you a, a little synopsis. I know this is kind of boring for um, you to read through. Um, to me, I find it kind of fascinating. Um, if you start from left to right, you can see like the five year old brain, brain the frontal, uh, the cortex is like the learning part, you know, when they're learning how to tie their shoes, they're learning colors, they're learning, you know, all the kindergarten things that um, kids learn, you know, those, those repetitive things that you're going to constantly use as, as they grow. And then the preteen brain is, you know, going through those same things again, you know, all of those adult things that they're going to learn over and over and over again. Um, and then, you know, the teen brain, the same type of thing, all of those executive functions, those things that they're going to continually learn that you need to be able to um, put into your brain and it's and, and you want to make sure that you're going to retain that information. And then the 20 year old brain, same thing. That's when it starts to slow down again. It doesn't mean that you're going to just stop learning. It's not like that. It just, um, it's going to, it's going to take you a little bit longer to retain all of that information. Well, if you're a preteen or, you know, into your mid twenties and you start to introduce intoxicants into your brain, it's going to be harder for you to be able to retain that information, or it's going to be harder for you to um, be able to recollect that information as quickly as you would if you didn't um, introduce intoxicants into your brain. Uh, I just want to add on, on that point, what you were talking about with the development. When you're a teenager, particularly, the last things to develop, you learn how to walk and talk and do all those basic functions, but now you're learning your cognitive functions. So your problem solving, um, decision making, uh, empathy, different emotional behaviors and those are the learned ones and that's why it's even particularly dangerous um, for the developing brain to introduce different substances into it. Well that's a very good point. Thank you. I completely forgot to point that out. Thanks Lindsay. Yeah it's very yeah. interesting though. Yeah it is. I agree. Um, and like this slide here you take the one on the left is a 15 year old male who's a non-drinker who's never touched alcohol ever and then the right is a 15 year old male heavy drinker and you can see the activity within the brain um, is a very huge difference um, the one thing about and you know down at the bottom it has you know the long lasting effects the, mem the memory functions are completely different um, and then the one thing about this slide too that you'll notice is the one on the right is two weeks alcohol free so this is not something that is going to um, change immediately if a heavy drinker just stops I mean, after time, it will start to rebuild and your brain can, you know, come back after a while. But um, if you become addicted, it's something that your brain is going to have a very hard time, you know, coming, coming back and, and regenerating those brain cells. So we try to educate, you know, our youth on the fact that, you know, we, we don't want you doing this. We don't want you to have to, um, we don't want you to introduce any type of intoxicants into your system because it's it's really going to affect you in the long term. Um, again, talking about ages, I mean, there's certain things that you can't do, um, you know, as you grow up, you know, you can't be president of the United States till you're 35, can't join the military till you're 18, can't rent a car until you're 25. I mean, there's certain reasons for this because cognitively you are not able to um, understand certain decisions that you have to make until you're a certain age. I mean, we, we wouldn't want a 15 year old running the nation, for instance. Um, it would be very difficult for them to be able to make those executive decisions. Um, this slide here, it talks about addiction and alcoholism. Um, the younger that you start drinking, um, the greater the risk you have of becoming addicted to alcohol. Um, Obviously, 13 and younger, you know, the chances of you um, becoming addicted to alcohol is much greater than if you wait until you're of age and start drinking. Um, and then obviously, if you are already drinking at this point, um, the chances of you not becoming addicted if you stop now is much greater.
um, this is your forte, Lindsay, so it's all on you. All right, so there are a lot of myths with marijuana, as we have talked about um, for majority of reasons. Um, one is because we know a lot about alcohol because we've been able to do a lot of research on alcohol. With marijuana, um, we haven't done as much research on it, um, but we are doing research and we're finding out more and more. So that's why it's important to, to look at what are the myths and the facts. So here, a common myth is marijuana focuses me. We hear that you can study better, maybe you feel more focused, but as you can tell, um, this is a myth. The fact is that THC, which is the part of um, weed that gets you really high, it affects a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is necessary for your learning. So these effects can last long after the high is gone. In fact, college students who use are much more likely to drop out than those who don't. So this is a myth that people say it helps them focus better. And really, drugs can affect individuals differently. Um, but in fact, it is it hasn't been proven to, um, people say they feel more motivated. There's no research that shows that it actually um, helps with motivation at all. Um, in fact, it comes with more fuzzy feelings. And so this is, um, it doesn't focus. And I think we all know that. Let's go on to the next myth. Ah, myth, it's safer than alcohol. Um, people will say this too, that it's safer because alcohol, um, because it's not addictive. The fact is one in six people who start using in their teens will become addicted. In 2018, over 4.4 million people were diagnosed with a substance use disorder, specifically to marijuana. Again, this is another common misperception. People think that marijuana is not addictive. I hear this a lot. Um, and again, because of the research, we don't have as much, but what has been found is that although marijuana doesn't have as intense physical withdrawals as alcohol, um, when people are very addicted to alcohol, once they, when, once they stop, their body literally shuts down. Um, marijuana doesn't have those type of extreme physical withdrawals, but they do have um, pretty significant psychological um, and, and mental withdrawals. So people who, um, if they don't get their, their high, they start getting irritable, um, more anxious. Um, that has been found. Also different things, you know, sometimes you hear that marijuana gets you hungry, you, you get the munchies. So without marijuana, it's been found that people don't have their appetite. People say that marijuana helps them sleep. It's been found that people who are withdrawing can't sleep really well when they're trying to sober up from marijuana. So we do find some um, psychological withdrawals that do prove that there is some um, substance use disorder independency linked with marijuana. And again, all these myths with cognitive it, um, drugs affect directly affect your brain and your cognitive ability. So people say they drive better when they're high, which is a little scary, huh? Um, they say I'm a better driver when I'm high because it helps to relax me. You want a relaxed driver or a cautious driver? You know? So driving is a divided attention task. You're doing many things at once. Um, THC mutes your senses. Um, and mutes all the things that you need to be able to do, which is to react to things quickly, um, to go a lot slower, decrease coordination, all these things you kind of need to be uh, on your P's and Q's when you're driving. Um, and so this is, a, this is a crazy myth to me. Um, people think they can drive better when they're high. I'm sure people think they can drive better when they're drunk too, but we know that uh, that doesn't work. So again, this is, affects your cognitive abilities. And so we can see here that slower reactions um, isn't what we want on the road. And there are many more myths, it's, it's crazy. There's a lot of research out there. I do urge you to do some more of your own as well. And we'll just kind of, again, uh, we mentioned that cannabis, marijuana, um, weed pot has so many names, is addictive. 4.4 million people have been diagnosed with the addiction disorder specific to marijuana. And like I was saying, um, it, it has more psychological withdrawal effects, but it has been shown that within two to three weeks, um, you can kind of start to sober up and, and to 
um, you do have some impairment afterwards, but after a while, you know, you can get out of it. And so that is the good thing. Um, with addiction, there's always hope to get out of it in recovery. And so we do find, research has found that, you know, within a couple of weeks or a few weeks that we are able to get past it. And so that, that is some hope in that. But it does even after two weeks. And we also know that THC stays into your bloodstream for over 30 days, just about 30 days. So that's something to keep in mind too, that um, when you smoke, it's still in your bloodstream for a month. So that has a lot to do too with um, the addictive quality of it because it's still in your system. Okay, thank you, Lindsay, very much. Okay, so now let's talk about now if you don't have the issue or you don't drink or you don't um, partake in any type of drugs whatsoever, but you know people that are like, um, friends, maybe family members, um, there are also ways that you can try to help them or um, show that you really care or you're concerned about them. So you want to talk to them about how you feel, let them know that you're worried about them, share any type of local resources that you may have. Um, you can talk to counselors at school or teachers or other adults that are in your family um, for any type of advice. Um, there's a national hotline that you can call. We have the number on the screen. Um, or you can also text home to 741741 and you can talk to someone through text and they can help direct you into an area or a local um, counseling area or um, place that you can go to try and get some help. Um, and then also you can invite them to different things that you do that don't include drugs or alcohol. Okay, so this next one um, about how often does the average teen see a reference to alcohol on TV? Um, this is this is another good one that I like because a lot of people don't seem to understand how often they see it or how often they don't I guess so do you think it's every 10 minutes 20 minutes hour or hour and a half hmm. okay so most everybody said every 20 minutes And that was right, about every 20 minutes. So alcohol still remains the number one drug that's per, um, portrayed on American television, at least. Uh, drinking scene every 22 minutes, smoking every 57 minutes, and every illicit drug, uh, drug use every 112 minutes. Um, so if you kind of put it into perspective, you're going to see somebody drink during every sitcom a smoking scene during every drama series or an illicit drug use during every movie. Um, so you have to realize that um, Hollywood, it's just a show. So just a few examples, um, like the movie 21 Jump Street, um, you know, they buy a whole bunch of high school kids alcohol um, and there's drugs shown in it. Um, in nearly every episode of Vampire Diaries, they are drinking. Um, and that includes the high school kids that are truly high school kids and the vampires that were turned at the age of 16, 17, 18, even though they may be like 150 years old for the show, but they're still within that teenage years and they're drinking throughout. Um, or for the movie 21 and over, the main character had to drink his way through eight levels of the dorms to be able to um, be part of the actual like in crowd. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of how much influence there is in TV or movies with teen drinking. Again, that's why we think that all the kids are using because mm -hmm. we see it and the kids see it. They watch Euphoria, they watch all these shows and they see it constantly in front of them. And so they assume, well, everyone's doing it. I need to do it. Um, and again, we see from data that actually most kids aren't consistently using it. So it's crazy. Very true. Um, and this is another thing that we like to talk about too, is just because you're taking the keys away or making sure that um, people who are under the age of 21 aren't driving is it's not always um, helping with the underage fatalities. Because if you look at this graphic here that 32% are related to traffic deaths, but it's all the other aspects, the more than almost 70% um, are still underage drinking related deaths. Um, so you still have homicides, suicides, alcohol poisoning, drownings, fires, all of those other key aspects 
of underage alcohol related deaths that don't have anything to do with being in a vehicle. Um, and those are the things that we're obviously worried about too when it comes to underage drinking. So put yourself into these type of situations um, where alcohol or drugs may be um, brought up into um, a situation, you know, you're hanging out with friends, um, you guys might go to Sonic or Burger King, Dairy Queen, you know, wherever, and someone or a couple people within the group start talking about adding weed or alcohol to the party, and you start thinking about, you know, if you go or one of your friends goes, you know, what does that entail for, you know, the next 30 minutes to the next day, to the next week, to the next month, to the next year? Um, and then what would you do? Um, those are the types of things that you need to think about, you know, removing yourself from those situations and then removing your friends from that situation. And then maybe trying to change the mind of the person that brought it up to begin with. Um, these, we want to make sure that we address this as well. Um, even though we're talking about, um, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Um, we also are very aware that it's going to happen. Um, we're not completely ignorant on that subject, but we also want to make sure that if it does happen, where you find yourself in a situation where someone that you know, or even don't know, um, if you're at a party or at someone's house or at college, and you notice that someone has passed out or is very sick. These are the signs that you need to watch for in case they have alcohol poisoning. You know, they start getting sick, they're vomiting, have shortness of breath, they're pale, cold, and clammy, or they're starting to pass out or have already passed out. You need to call for help. Please make sure you call for help. Um, you don't want to not call for help and then end up having that person pass away. Um, that would not be good at all, obviously. Um, again, when doing my research, I want everyone to know that this little Georgia code that showed up at the bottom, this is actually stated in the state constitution. If you call for help because you're trying to save that person's life, you will not get in trouble. You will not get arrested. You will not be charged with anything for you know being underage or having possession of alcohol or anything because you were trying to save a life. So don't ever think that, oh my gosh, if I call the cops because so-and-so may be um, having an overdose or maybe um, dying from alcohol poisoning, I'm gonna get in trouble so I'm not gonna call. That Get that out of your mind because the police, the EMTs, anybody, they are not gonna do anything whatsoever because you are trying to save a life. Um, a lot of you think that, that, you know, that they're going to get in trouble for doing that. Please do not think that. They can't do that. Um, because it's much better to call and find out that they're okay than to not call and find out that they're not. And that is something that we want to make sure that we convey to you guys today. Okay, so for the next point question, we wanna know how many teens admit to being the passenger to a drinking driver? So do we think it's one in five, one in four, one or three, or none? None. That would be Wouldn't you like that? So majority says one in three. And that's correct. Mm -hmm. Quite a bit if you think about it. It's two of us in this group if you think about it. Yeah. So we're gonna watch one video here real quick. I'm Kathy Kilgore Beeler from Dixon, Tennessee. My only child, my son, Cole Kilgore, at age 19, decided to get into a truck with a, an impaired driver. 
He was under the influence of alcohol and drugs. Cole was not. He was a sober passenger. But he made that terrible choice to get in the vehicle with that man. And they crashed. It was a single car crash. And they hit a guardrail and exploded into flames. When you were told that all Cole, we were told that although Cole was on fire, because when they crashed, the truck exploded into flames, that he tried to help the driver. And then he had to stop, drop, roll, and put himself out. And a good Samaritan had stopped also was trying to help him and Cole kept telling him he kept saying it call my mom call my mom because he was really hurt he was burned over 95 percent of his body and he wanted me so that happened on June 4th, 2011, four years ago today. And he lived for 10 hours and died on June 5th, 2011, at age 13. So, like I said, you know, passengers will get in, um, you know, when they're underage, you know, one in three. So they may not have been drinking, but their drivers may have. So you want to make sure that you're, even though you're doing the right thing, that the people that you are with are also doing the right thing. And again, um, whoever, you know, whether it be your parents, your grandparents, or, you know, older sibling, somebody who's sober would much rather you call them to get a ride home or, you know, use a Uber or taxi or whatever to get home. And, to put yourself for another person in a situation and try and get them home safe too. Um, they may be mad at you at the time, but I'm sure they'll be over it by the morning. I'll guarantee you. Um, so we have some information that you guys can get. Um, we have uh, pamphlets that you can download actually at um, mad.org. Um, you'll be getting an email directly after this uh, or you can download that information. Um, and we also have um, a program that you can take where it's kind of like a train the trainer where um, we have staff that can train you to teach your um, friends the same type of program. This is only one small section, um, but we expanded it specifically for today. Um, but um, yeah, so you can actually be the one to make sure that your friends are uh, educated on being able to take a stand on your own to make sure that you're going to be drug and alcohol free. And on, and on this, it's so important because as we were talking about, again, I keep bringing it up, but our social norms, most kids aren't and most kids want to make good choices. And so a lot of kids, when I ask them, you know, why do you think people are using, it's usually due to peer pressure or the idea of peer pressure. So if you want to take a stand and take a class like that and be able to lead your peers, they're going to listen to you a lot more than they're going to listen to us as adults. Really? <laughs> and you can start it, and I think you'd be surprised how many of your peers would um, really appreciate that type of leadership and would follow it. Um, but someone does have to make the stand, so that's really important. But that's the information that we have for you. So if anybody's got any questions, definitely ask away. Um, we have a chat box if you don't want to ask, um, you know, through um, the Zoom itself. Um, but we'll leave the floor open as long as, you know, anybody wants to be able to talk. Um, 
we're a wealth of information, but if we don't have it, we can always get back to you. We tried to make it as painless as possible. <laughs> None? You mean we covered everything? We were that good? We were that good. <laughs> it's a lot of information. Um, I was so happy to, to be invited. Um, and of course, what Teresa said, if there's any other questions, even after this, um, she's always here, here at Beyond the Bell, we're always here. Um, prevention is a big part of our work and is all about education, all about getting together and collaboration. So just really exciting. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming on, Lindsay. I, I greatly appreciate it. I know you are a wealth of knowledge on some stuff, um, a lot of stuff that I don't know much about. So I'm very. That's the wealth of knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I'm very glad you were here today. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, if you guys don't have any other questions for me or Lindsay, um, We'll go ahead and end the session. But again, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, you know, um, feel free to get a hold of us. Um, like I said, you'll get an email before the end of today um, that you can always email us back with any questions you might think of later. And we appreciate you being here today. So, thank you. See you next week.